our team during this transition. I can't ask you to raise your hand tonight, but I know several of you are listening in. Thank you for your unwavering support. Tonight, I am so pleased to welcome Carl Wilkins as part of our permanent exhibition highlight series. This series gives an in-depth look into different parts of our permanent exhibition. From tonight's program on the Rwandan genocide, which is featured in our 10 stages of genocide gallery, to next month's presentation on the history of Asian Americans in the US and beyond, we hope you will join us and keep an eye out for these programs. I'm especially pleased that our first virtual program features Carl Wilkins. He spoke at our previous Small But Mighty Museum in 2014, and all of us who heard him speak that night were changed for the better. For over a decade, Carl Wilkins has been speaking all over the world to inspire and equip people to enter the world of the other, urging his audiences to hold public officials accountable to doing all that they can to stop and prevent genocide. He was the only American who chose to stay in Kigali, Rwanda throughout the 1994 genocide. Venturing out each day into the streets, crackling with mortar and gunfire, he worked his way through roadblocks of angry, blood-stained soldiers and civilians to bring food, water, and medicine to orphans trapped around the city. In 2011, Carl published a book about his experiences titled, I'm Not Leaving, and he is the focus of a documentary by the same name. I don't know about you, but I know that I definitely need a little inspiration right now. Tonight, we are very fortunate to be able to learn from a true upstander. Carl Wilkins' story demonstrates each individual's ability to take a stand to make a difference, even in the face of personal danger. Not unlike the healthcare providers and first responders who are putting their personal health at risk to care for those who are battling COVID-19 here in Dallas and around the world. They are pretty inspiring too. As Annie mentioned, we will leave time for questions at the end of Carl's presentation. If you have a question, please use the Q&A button located at the bottom of your screen to type out and submit your question. And now, please help me welcome Carl Wilkins. I have a little message on my screen. All right. When, oh, okay, you should have not calling you. Good, good. Um, well, thank you guys very much for gathering together. I was looking forward to being in Houston this week, and um, I am sort of still there. Uh, it's, it's, it's um, as Mary Pat said, it's a really challenging time. Um, and for some of us, maybe we flash back to other times. This evening, as I, as I share some of the story of Rwanda with you, I, I have been thinking a lot about almost 26 years ago, stuck in my house, um, only a lot, a lot different situation going on in terms of people outside. Um, but I don't wanna go right into that right away. I love to start talking about Rwanda with Rwanda today. I always tell people, don't ride the taxi. Okay, it's dangerous to take the motorcycle taxi, but then that's me on the taxi because I love taking the motorcycle taxis. This was just, okay, looks like an accident. I think I'm just learning how to turn off the phone. Um, this was last April at the 25th commemoration. And I'm so excited that Rwanda, if you type in Rwanda and hit images, you don't come up with genocide first thing anymore. Rwanda is so much more than genocide. You come up with all this beautiful countryside and you know one of the top tourist destinations. So it's gonna be, and then of course, yeah, as you go on a little farther, you will start to see um, uh, segments of it. And as is very, um, very much evident as you travel around the country, the memorial sites are there. 
but I, I'd love to start with the idea that Rwanda is so much more than genocide. Usually I get to go to Rwanda um, every year with school teachers and this last year I thought I'd be going twice, once with teachers, once with students, but I ended up going seven times to Rwanda, which is um, which was just incredible. My last trip was in December and I was here in the state of the art um, conference center in Kigali and we were having what I would call a reverse State of the Union address. Um, I say reverse because I don't know where we got the idea that the president should tell the country how the country is doing. Rwanda has, has it right. The people tell the president. People, citizens' priorities, government programs, how well are they meeting each other's needs? So for two days, the president is here. In fact, if you could see yeah, it's going to be too hard to see detail. That little gray head right there is this gray head right here. I had, a, I had a great seat right behind the government ministers. And you might have thought that this would be a, perhaps turn into a gripe session or a complaint session. Um, but they always started, true to Rwandan culture, they always started with a thank you for this. We appreciate that, you know. Thank you for this early childhood development center in this community. In the neighboring community, we're working. We need to get one developed here in this area. They always started with a thank you. I think probably one of the most moving uh, testimonies, though, during those two days was a young man. There was another arena about 15 miles away with probably 2,000 young people. Oh, by the way, I forgot to tell you, all scattered around the country are white event tents, you know, like at a wedding, an, an event tent, and high-speed internet connection. So people were speaking right in on the big screens to the conference center. People were tweeting in their comments. They were WhatsApping. They were all the social media platforms. And the government collated all of that, responded, actually prepared a document uh, based on all of that feedback that is influencing this year's policy. Of course, Rwanda plans much farther ahead than just a year. When I was there, they were talking 2050. Um, so I am excited to get into um, Rwanda. We're going to go right back to 1990. Uh, I often ask students, um, you know, do you see any resemblance? <laughs> My wife hasn't changed at all, but um, somehow I, yeah. I'm still glad to have hair. Um, but we were in France, learning French, 1990. Um, our two daughters had actually been born in Zimbabwe when we were working there, Zimbabwe and Zambia, and we moved to Rwanda in the spring of 1990. I was working with the Adventist Development Relief Agency, the humanitarian arm of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and some of our first projects were building schools, super rewarding work, working there, doing that for the first four years. Quick little history lesson. We'll go back to the late, late 1800s. The Germans were the colonizers after World War I. The Belgians were there. I'm not going to go into the program of eugenics. I mean, some of you are familiar with eugenics and, and particularly what we did here in America. But the idea among the Belgians was somehow we have to figure out who's who. Who is superior? I'm, I am not going to lay the genocide at the feet of the colonizers. However, everybody had a, a role in, in playing, uh, in setting the stage, I guess I would say, for this horrible event that would happen um, in 1994. And so the Belgians developed their ID cards. As you can see on this card, um, it would have the word Hutu, the majority group there, uh, which is crossed out on this card, Tutsi. So evidently this person would be a Tutsi. Twa, the smallest group there, and naturalized. These cards would be like um, death warrants for the Tutsi people during the 1994 genocide. Um, to, to just kind of finish our quick little history lesson here, in 62, independence will come. Instead of saying we're done with this Hutu Tutsi, um, what do you call when you give people a quota system? Instead of saying we're done with this quota system, they, they, they started talking about Hutu power. Tragically, many Tutsi people were killed. Others were hid, protected by their neighbors. Many fled to the neighboring countries. I think they probably thought, we'll be back in a couple weeks, couple months. No, two years, 10, the existing government, 20 years. Nope, there's no room. 
not welcome back here. So in 1990, mostly refugees will form the Rwandan Patriotic Front and they will say, okay, we can't come home peacefully. We're coming home by force. And a war started for three years. Um, the Rwandan Patriotic Front was led by General Paul Kagame, who is the president of Rwanda today. Fortunately, after three years, we thought, Phew, we're going to have peace now. Everybody lay your guns down. They, they had a, the Arusha people, some nine power government. But unfortunately, that government was delayed and delayed. Didn't happen in December like it was scheduled. Didn't happen um, in January. By now, about 2,000, 2,500 UN troops had arrived in Rwanda saying, hey, good job, Rwanda. The whole world is here with you. We stand with you. You know, that idea of presence. And they did make a big difference in terms of helping people. Whew, this is going to be okay. But tragically, this is going to be one of the worst examples of a false sense of security. When April finally comes around, I actually included this picture a little bit, a little hesitant. This is, this is the picture of the men and women, the core group. It's actually a picture out of the Kigali Genocide Memorial. The core group of men and women who we would say are the authors of the genocide, the planners, the executioners of the genocide. Front and center, this gentleman with the beard, we're gonna to refer to him a little later in our story today. Kambanda was appointed the prime minister. You see um, the president's plane, well, let me, let me just touch on genocide for a minute. I know most of you are familiar with this word. As I travel and, and uh, have conversations with students about genocide, I haven't found a more, um, a more direct way, a more understandable way of describing where genocide comes from. Where does this come from? How can, how can people, this is my little visual aid, how can people go from kind and generous to murderers? And, and, and then, of course, what, we're, what I'm excited to talk about this evening is, is it possible, you can't go back, life doesn't go back, is it possible for them to ever be kind and generous, trusted neighbors again? And this idea that my world would be better without you in it is, is a false, there's no such place as my world except in my head. But we're working as we study these stories and exploring how we can transition our thinking from my world thinking to our world thinking. So I wanted to just really make sure I was clear on this point that the Rwandan genocide was not about Hutus hating Tutsis, Tutsis hating Hutus. This was not a tribal um, grassroots movement. This was politicians manipulating the needs of ordinary people to achieve their ends of staying in power, of eliminating the opposition. The, the Hutu and Tutsi people married each other by the thousands. In fact, the planners of the genocide had to work hard to break the bonds between Hutus and Tutsis. And so um, with that little bit of background, we'll come to that night around eight o'clock, as I remember, Wednesday night, April 6, 1994, my parents were actually visiting and dad says, whoa, heard that explosion? I said, yeah. He says, what do you think that was? I'm, I said, I don't know. We had heard hand grenades and gunfire, but this was a lot bigger than that. And it wasn't long before the phone rang and we found out that um, the president had been killed. And, and it wasn't just the phone call. We started to hear gunfire. Kigali is a city built on hills. And those gunfire, that would echo, echo ricochet, kind of like cascading water, as it would ricochet throughout the city. And the killing started, it's documented, less than an hour after the plane was shot down. Thousands of people every day. Um, General Dallaire, the commander of the UN force, had to be one of the most tortured people at that point in time. Not, not trying to compare it to the Tutsi people who were hunted and, hunted and killed, but he was representing the world. And he had enough soldiers if he would simply have the support to stop this. 
First time since the end of World War II, when the whole world was saying this phrase, never again, people saw the Holocaust and they couldn't imagine that that was even possible in the furnaces and, and all of the horrors. And they said, yeah, never again. And now we had soldiers in a country that we didn't have to knock on doors. Can you give us soldiers? They were there. They could have stopped it. But New York would not listen to their people in Rwanda. And, and that's probably a theme you're going to hear a couple more times this evening about the benefit or the disaster of not listening to the people on the ground. So for the American government, for most other embassies, all other, in fact, that I know of, they, they made the decision real quick. Ours was made on Friday. Plane shot down Wednesday night, Friday. Everybody's leaving, they said. Um, the American, Canadians, and Germans said, ah, probably not a good idea to fly out. We think that's too risky. I don't know if they were thinking about the president's plane being shot down. We're driving out. And they said, uh, I had actually been meeting at the embassy for several weeks with situation reports. We had planned if things, because we knew we were sitting on like a keg of dynamite. But I think it was this overly optimistic hope that we had that it would be diffused and, and, and peace would come. So we had assembly points identified. We put the evacuation plans into effect. First convoys leaving on Saturday, the, the last convoys on Sunday, made it really clear, bring, bring, of course, bring your family. This picture was probably about a week before the, the genocide happened that my mom and dad were visiting there. And um, yeah, of course, bring your mom and dad. Bring your family. In fact, you can bring anybody you want in the convoy except Rwandans. We rightfully, we rightfully condemn the planners of the genocide for killing people based on their ID card. However, the American government made decisions. And again, there's plenty of stories of the American government, Washington, D.C., not listening to their people in Kigali. Um, but Washington, D.C. made the decisions and uh, called the shots. And, and um, they said, don't bring any Rwandans. We'll be stopped at many roadblocks before we get to Burundi, the country to the south. I, I didn't give you a little geography. We're right in the middle of Africa, if you haven't looked at that lately, right below the equator. Um, don't bring any Rwandans. Well, our family wasn't just our children and mom and dad. We had been there for four years. There was a young lady who lived and worked in our home who loved on our kids. And when somebody loves on your kids, that's like fast track into family. She had a Tootsie ID card. The young man who came in the evening as the watchman, he had a Tootsie ID card. They were both marked to be killed. And the embassy is telling us, in effect, to leave part of our family behind. Teresa and I went into the bedroom, we talked, we prayed, we just, we couldn't see our way clear to leaving them pretty much convinced that they would be killed. And Rwanda, we had enjoyed this incredible um, privilege. The people of Rwanda are hospitable and generous. And I know sometimes I'm like, do you hear yourself talking? You're talking about a genocide on one hand, and you're talking about people who are hospitable and generous on the other. But I would put forth to you that it only takes a couple of cells like cancer, a couple of cells of discrimination, of, of um, uh, when, you, when you hire, yeah, discrimination, what's the other word I want to use there? When you are um, uh, dividing people like apartheid and all of these things, it, it doesn't take much to spoil a country in terms of that kind of poison thinking. Fear like gas on the fire and this idea of us and them. And the radios had been broadcasting messages against the Tutsi. Songs, comedians who were hilarious, songs with catchy tunes, but all of them had messages. It's like the radio waves were carrying bricks into people's homes. And on those bricks, there would be a message against the Tutsi. And some people built a wall with those bricks until they could no longer see their neighbor. They just saw this poster on the wall that said enemy. But there was still this incredible privilege and respect that was given to foreigners. And I said to Teresa, maybe I can use that to help these two people. And, and if I get carried away with my story and forget to tell you, they do survive the genocide. So Teresa, um, I will actually, 
I had built a little pickup camper, a little camper on the back of our pickup truck. I, I used to be a shop teacher, you know, auto mechanics, welding and stuff. You look at the kids, they don't look terrified here. I, I give Teresa so much credit for, for doing what a lot of moms do in these situations, tell you it's going to be okay. I'm not going anywhere. We're going to make it. And so Teresa and the children, as I said, they drove out. My dad was the one actually who was driving. Teresa, the kids, and, and their grandma, my mom, were in the back with the curtains drawn. And so Teresa doesn't want to go back to America. She's afraid of losing contact. She'll have to eventually leave Burundi to go to Nairobi. But um, the best part of every day for me, every day during the genocide, was to talk to Teresa on the radio. I'm going to just give us um, a couple of quick snapshots of 1994, and then I want to move forward into Rwanda's journey after the genocide. Um, we're just sitting around the dining room table here. I think it was some morning prayers during the genocide, the young lady, the young man, and Pastor Soraya and his wife, Mrs. Soraya, Phoebe, wonderful couple. Actually, here's a picture from last April. They're retired in Rwanda now. She was this um, one who was able to diffuse when people came to the gate to kill the people in our house. She talked to them like an auntie. She helped us get food. Uh, buying food from the thieves. Deep well. I said, Pastor, it's, it's fantastic that Anita and Janvier is like, but we got to do more. And I'll never, never forget what he said. He said, Carl, he's not a guy who talks a lot, but when he talks, you'll listen. He says, Carl, if you're going to do anything outside, outside our fence, you got to build a relationship with the people in power. And so that will be the beginning of building many relationships during the genocide. I really didn't know what, what we could do out there. I knew people were being killed, but I'm like, we got to do something. So we went to the government headquarters in the capital city. Colonel Renzaho um, was like the mayor of the city, you could call him, kind of the governor of the region, military. And um, I introduced myself. He's actually in prison um, now captured, tried, convicted of his different roles in the genocide. Um, but when we met, he seemed very concerned about my safety. And I said, hey, I want to help. I'm the director for ADRA. How can I help? Uh, there's some orphanages. He prepared a travel permit so that when I came to the roadblocks, I would show them this document. They would let me through. See, the, the whole city was like every block was a roadblock. And the murdering was happening everywhere. I, I, I don't. And tonight I chose not to use any graphic images, um, you know, hoping maybe the whole family could come for, for the story here. Um, but you, you, if, you, if you really want to dig deeper into 1994, there's a documentary called Ghost of Rwanda, PBS Frontline, Ghost of Rwanda. Um, it will give you uh, an in-depth look at 1994. Um, but the, the colonel said to me that, um, I've got a couple of ideas. There's a Frenchman who stayed. He's got some orphans. You could go check him out. And then there's a big orphanage in Yamirambo, uh, one, of the, one of the poorer neighborhoods of the city, large, densely populated neighborhood in the city. And in that um, area, there was an orphanage operated by a man named Damas Gasimba, his wife Beatrice. Some of you actually may have heard Damas's story on Humans of New York. Uh, he has a very incredible, inspiring story. I'm going to think, I think Damas was probably around 34 at that time. This 34-year young man and his wife with their new baby um, are, are housing, well, started with 80 kids. And then it went on to 180, 200. By the time the genocide ends, there'll be more than 400 children there. And, and so... I will go, actually the first time that I arrived there, I, um, I saw little piles like dirt. Something was dug up in the, in the parking lot, what? And he told me it was graves of the children, not ones who had been killed by the genocide. Well, yeah, they were killed by the genocide, but another form of murder. They, they, they died of diarrhea and dysentery. They had no water. And so that was the first, and that became the primary work of myself, one of my colleagues from ADRA, Dawson, who was working with me, another colleague from ADRA, Gasiqua, these, these gentlemen just um, 
uh, Elise, they're just uh, courageous men. And you know, um, while Gasiqua was helping me bring water, back home, he had more than 40 people he was trying to protect in his, well, he was protecting at least for as long as he could. It's, it's, um, it's a remarkable story. When, when his neighbors came to kill, I mean, they had been listening to the radio. They had been building these walls, you know, out of the propaganda. They couldn't see, you know, their neighbor. They just saw the enemy. But Gasiqua didn't see the enemy. He saw neighbors. And, and when I would say, there's a couple of killers, Gasiqua would say, no, those are fathers. And, and he came out of his house saying, Bernard, your daughters must be hungry. Huh? Maybe the night before, Bernard had put his little girl to bed. Daddy, I'm hungry. Here, love, take, take a little drink of water. No, no, I, I'm, I want food tomorrow. And how could he imagine that tomorrow, when he went to kill somebody, he would be greeted with kindness? Um, excuse me. Gasiqua just is one of, uh, of many, I'd like to say many people, who really exemplify. Um, this is kind of my little how the world works here. <laughs> Everybody wants purpose. Everybody wants community. But if we'll start with an environment of respect, where, where everybody is valued and we can learn each other's stories, then the empathy just begins to grow. I say, hey, do you have any brothers? Oh, yeah, I've got, oh, I've got two brothers. As soon as we hear each other's stories, we begin to connect the dots, and the empathy begins to grow. The power of stories is, is, I think, one of the most powerful forces on the world. And when we begin to learn each other's stories, and we begin to connect the dots, and the empathy grows, we're like, hey, why don't you come home with me? Huh? Inclusion doesn't become some forced idea. It becomes the icing on the cake. It becomes just a natural response. I think we're wired for empathy. I think we're wired. I know we're wired for community. And so Gasiqua is just to me a, 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 an, a, an inspiring example of how an environment of respect can promote the growth of empathy and inclusion. These are a couple, as you can probably tell, three of my favorite values to explore during that time. But let's. Um, Let's wrap up. What time do we have here? I gotta look at my watch. My timekeeper is right here with me. Okay, 25 to. So, the last little story from 94. Gesiqua and I show up at the orphanage towards the end of June, and we're surrounded within five minutes by militia guys with their machine guns and their machetes. They had said the day before, we're coming tomorrow. I don't know why they gave warning. Often they didn't give warning. We're coming tomorrow. We know you have Tootsies. Empty this place because anybody who remains, we're going to kill, which was really un, uh, unusual. It was very unusual for them to, to give warning be before a massacre. Maybe it had something to do with the respect that they had for Damas, the director. I'm not sure. But the short version of this story is we're going to have about a two-hour standoff, maybe three. Hard to keep track of time in, in moments like that. But they weren't coming in as long as I was there, it seemed. And eventually, I got a hold of the Red Cross. I mean, it was terrifying there in the orphanage. The kids who were looking out the window, they, they recognized these men as people who had killed their parents, their siblings. This, I can't begin to communicate to you the, um, the trauma of that moment. Um, let me just pause for a minute too. Uh, used to be when I told this story, I got this big knot in my stomach, like I was right back in the middle of that horrible moment. And, and, and I may not get the chance today to talk about how important, um, dealing with that trauma has been, um, for me. And I won't, I won't go into detail right now, unless one of you want to talk about it. But um, I can tell that story today now without knots in my stomach. I still might get tears in my eyes, which I don't want to lose. But I can tell it without knots in my stomach because I got, I got professional counseling. I was journaling. And because I can tell my wife, my brothers, my father, any, any, I, I have a support system. Um, and so I just, I just don't want to pass over that. I was, was kind of like doing a little body check as I was telling the story. And I was like, yeah, I'm okay. I'm okay. Um, but, but this story is going to have a really 
crazy ending where they won't get massacred, which is, which is unbelievable. I get a hold of Philip Gaillard, the um, director of the International Red Cross. You, you'll meet him if you watch that documentary, Ghost of Rwanda, Swissman. He will he'll contact the police. He'll send some police officers. They'll come, about seven of them. I'll say, man, I'm so glad you're here. And, and he'll say, I, would you spend the night? I said, no, no, we're too outnumbered. You go get help. And then I got this terrible dilemma. Do I, do I leave? Because it seems like for some reason, as long as I've been here, I don't know if it's, I don't know why. They have different perceptions. I don't know why, but as long as I've been here, they haven't come in. What if I leave? And what if these police officers join in the massacre? Because I had heard about police officers participating in the genocide. I had also seen police officers help me in my work. I finally decided to trust him and I left. I went to the colonel's office, which, um, I knew he wasn't there, but I didn't know where else to go. And the secretary said, yeah, the colonel's not here, but the prime minister's here. Now remember, well, no, I didn't tell you this part. I, maybe I didn't mention, the prime minister was killed the second day of the genocide, this light image you see of a lady here. And this guy, the bearded guy who I pointed out in the center of the, in the photograph of the people who planned the genocide, Kambanda became the prime minister. And she's saying, he's here, a surprise visit. They had moved the government out of Kigali because it was too violent, too much war. And, and she's like, he's here on a surprise visit. Ask him for help. And I'm like, whoa, 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 wait, wait a minute. Because I had told her, the orphanage is surrounded. I think they're going to massacre everybody if they haven't already. She says, ask him for help. And I'm like, what, wait, what, what? He's in charge of the genocide. I didn't argue with her. I simply went out in the hallway, waited. I asked him, and he stopped the genocide. Now, I've got my theories as to why he did it, but I'm not going into them today. I'm just going to tell you, once again, how important it is to listen to the local people. And the other thing that's really a big deal for me is sometimes our most powerful allies can be found among the people we define as the enemy. And that is, that's a real game changer for me. The, the, the genocide will end when the Rwandan Patriotic Front drives the extremists out of power and out of the country. Ends on July 4 in Kigali, probably around the 12th or so of July around the country. I will go out, I will be reunited with Teresa and the kids in Nairobi. Um, we'll spend another year and a half in Rwanda before leaving. We're gonna fast forward now. Oh, I did wanna share with you the picture. This is the young lady who was there in our home, got married after the genocide, her handsome sons. Um, and of course, I have to show you a picture of our family all grown up. Um, our family, which has grown, we are so excited to have Jay, Lisa and Jay on the end, just got married a little more than a year ago. Um, and I was back home for probably about nine years before I took my first trip back to Rwanda. And I've been able to go back pretty much every year and sometimes multiple times. Well, last year was a record. Um, usually I'm going back with students and teachers. This was a group of students from Chicago this last summer and then a group of teachers from all around the US. We're actually at uh, Sina Gerard. Any of our Rwandan friends who are watching, they know this man for his hot sauce and his innovation. I mean, talk about innovation. I couldn't resist putting this picture in, huh? You just see a tree, but if you, we can zoom in close enough here, you will see blue water bottles, like from a cooler, hanging from the tree, cut. These are hanging gardens. We have carrots growing in a tree. This guy is an incredible innovator, but okay, back, to our, back to our story. Um, where I'm gonna try to unpack for you before we have a QA and a time, this um, not so much the journey of generous to murderous, but this journey of a murderer going back to being a trusted neighbor. Then this is, this is the part that is so, Really astounding. I mean, we, uh, some of us can't understand how somebody can go from generous to murders, but we see the bodies, we have the evidence, we do not, we don't doubt it. But I and many others doubt the possibility of somebody ever being trustworthy again after committing genocide. So we went to this place, it's called a little reconciliation village. And I'm gonna give you the fast version of this part as I get to our specific story. Um, but there's men and women gathered in this room who some of them are survivors and some of them are perpetrators. And they will, they will come and generously 
they will share their stories with us. Imagine yourself um, in this room, looking into bright smiles and others and wondering what is their story? What have they been through in the last 25 years? I, I was especially excited to be there with our students from Chicago and to see their reactions and for them to listen to these stories. And the story that I'm highlighting for you today is a story about Maria. And um, Maria would say her, her um, one of the closest family friends is how she would introduce Philbert. Um, Maria and I, uh, had a couple things in common. We both at the time of the genocide had three children and um, we both had very difficult conversations with our spouses about the safety of our children. We were able to send Teresa and I, our children, to safety. She and her husband didn't have that option. They decided to split up. She would take the daughter, he would take the three sons, two sons, I think. And I hope I have my numbers right, sometimes with translation, but that's the gist of the story. He would take the two sons, she would take the daughter, hoping that in smaller groups they could survive. It would work for her and the daughter, not for him and the son. Now, I introduced Philbert as a family friend. This summer, he was introduced to me as one of the people who participated in the genocide. Not only did he participate in the genocide, but he was in the gang that killed Maria and Philbert's, I mean, Maria's, Maria's husband and sons. I, I've really wrestled with how to tell this story because I, I'm not trying to be sensational. I mean, the stories of Rwanda are so sensational already. They seem beyond reality. But, but stick with me for a minute on this story. There's a lot to be pulled out of this story because it's easy to just say, oh, that's some sort of, you know, bizarre one in a million type of things. And Maria would tell you her story is not one in a million. But, but let me try my best to explain. This is the, the way I try to understand how people can go from murderers to trusted neighbors. And not just them, but how about people whose world have been upside, turned upside down and their families have been killed? Can they ever have a, help, a happy, happy, healthy life again? And so we're going to look at reframing, and we're also going to explore a tiny bit in neural pathways really quick. I mean, I'm not a scientist by any stretch of the imagination, but they tell us how we can form new pathways. Every time we get new information, we form a new pathway. And the more we fire those pathways, the, the stronger the outside coding, the myelin sheath becomes on that pathway. And so we're going to, we're going to enter into a story of people building new pathways and choosing which pathways to fire. We're gonna look at three big steps here in Rwanda for this journey to trust, this journey, restorative journey, restorative justice is the first part we'll look at. Rwandans had way too many people to try with conventional courts, so they reached back in their history and they pulled out what they call a homegrown solution. Rwanda has many homegrown solutions. And Gachacha was where prisoners like Filbert, many of them, you know, kind of just crammed in a prison where there wasn't enough space at the beginning, even for everybody to lay down at the same time, because there were just so many people who had participated or were accused in the genocide, but had a participated. You don't, when, it's, when more than a million people are killed by their neighbors, it's not a small group. And so, the prisoners were told, if you confess, you can be given half the normal sentence that, that has been decided for ordinary people. This, they kind of had top level organizers, mid level, and then the people like Filbert, the vast majority who were doing the killing. Filbert chose to confess. When he confessed, people learned, well, take Maria, for example. She learned where her husband and sons were buried. For years, this is my imagination, but see if this doesn't make sense. For years, I'm imagining that Maria is thinking, how did it happen? How did it end? Were the boys with their dad? Who died first? Was it long still? Man, I don't know where the grave is. Maybe they're not even dead. It's really hard to process imagine. I don't know if we can process imaginings. But when the truth comes out, Thursday afternoon, close school, close um, shops, go to the soccer field, confession, Gachacha will happen and people learn the truth. Then they have something, they have something to begin to work with in terms of processing.
From Gachacha, the people could go to what's called a Tij camp. That's work in the interest of the general public. Now, let me just give you one quick little visual of Gachacha. You would pick, the community would pick seven men and women. This little um, sash that they're wearing says a person of integrity. And those are the ones who would facilitate these, um, these confession experiences on the soccer field. And then they would go to, as I, as I mentioned here, and, and I'll just give you the outline, they would go to the Tiege camp, or what I call a reinvent yourself camp. And from there, they would come home where they could have shared experiences. Um, at the, at the Tiege camp, there's, it's not really a prison camp. There's no fence, no walls. The people are given a chance to do projects to benefit the community, not to pay back. You can't pay back for killing people. They're given a chance to benefit the community in, in road building and radical terracing, making bricks for schools. Maybe they even could go to church if they, on the weekend, put on civilian clothes, go to a local church. Imagine you're in a church and let's say we're singing Amazing Grace. We're in a church in Rwanda, okay? Amazing Grace, house. and all of a sudden, the, the, muse, the volume goes down. As they look, one of these ladies comes walking in the church. What pathway do you fire in your brain? Do you think, wow, I'm glad she's here, or there's somebody from the camp. Do you call it a killer camp? Do you call it a teach camp? We have choices what pathways we're gonna fire. And then she starts singing and, and that saved a oh, wretch. And she got a, not like me, she got a beautiful voice. Do you, you, do you form a new pathway about her? She's got an incredible voice. Or do you say, who cares? You know, um, she's a killer or, or she tortured her. Or, or. We have choices in terms of how we see. If we see people as only one thing, we will be blind to so many other things. From the camps, the people could come home. And here's where we'll come back to Maria and Filbert. They got engaged in a project of building homes together. Didn't want to see each other at the beginning, understandably. But, but because there was security and safety, and because the government was working intentionally, powerfully, towards the idea of unity and we are going to live together. We're not going to have a Hutsi, Hutu town or a Tutsi town. We are Rwandan. In fact, I, when I was there on another visit this summer, uh, this October, the president said, being Rwandan isn't really about being from a place. It's not about an ethnicity. It's about integrity. And that new identity that is being developed and grown in Rwanda is really making a difference. Not everybody is like Maria and Philbert. I mean, as they went on and had shared experiences and build new pathways in their brain, man, Maria built such so many new pathways in her brain that when her, she so redefined Philbert, she allowed Philbert to redefine himself. And she, she says, he helps me like my sons. Um, and he does it willingly. I'll be honest with you. When I first heard the story, my first thought was, yeah, well, if he wouldn't have killed your sons, they would be here to help you. But you see, I was stuck in 1994 with that kind of thinking. But instead, Maria, Maria made the choice to reinvent Philbert, even to the point of inviting him to her daughter's wedding. Um, I'm sure we've got questions that are coming here now. And as you can probably tell, I could go on and on with the stories. Um, but I am gonna, gonna hand it back. I'm looking forward to some conversation. I'm really grateful. I don't think I said this at the beginning to the Holocaust, uh, the Dallas Holocaust and Human Rights Museum team for this chance to be here. Thanks so much. And I do look forward to some of your questions that I think I've been seeing some little things go across the top of my we've screen. Got, we've got some questions for sure. And then we'll, we'll echo your thanks, Carl. We, we so appreciate you being here and um, for your flexibility and, and turning this into a virtual experience. I will say that um, Carl has actually been very helpful for us on, on how to do these kinds of events too. It's something he does quite a bit as well. So thank you for that. Um, but we'll go ahead and jump right into questions. So um, I'll start with, with this one. Um, just a, a light question to get you started. What about our world today makes you feel um, most afraid and what gives you the most hope? Um, I'll, I'll be honest, I, I, I have thought during this time of the coronavirus, um, people are, uh, are shut in their homes. People are looking at losing their retirement funds. 
on the one hand, people are just simply looking at not being able to pay the rent. On the other hand, they're looking at all kinds of hardships. And the idea of violence has come to my mind. Because when we, I stuck this little drawing on here. Um, this helps me to try to kind of, it's more of a self-reflection drawing than to try to blame, uh, to measure or judge. I don't want to judge other people. But I, but I often look at situations as a pathway to harm and a pathway to healing. And the word I've chosen for the pathway to harm is polarize, which I think is one of the most powerful tools on the pathway to harm. Something bad happens, we blame somebody for it. And then we do something violent. And if nobody stands up, if nobody, the government or individuals stand up, then it, can, it becomes the new norm. And more violence and more violence comes. The thing that gives me hope, though, during this time is this idea of restoration. And, and the idea, we all know this in our head, and many have practiced it, that we are stronger together. That when we find problems, blaming doesn't help anything. We need to find the cause, absolutely. But in restorative justice, everybody's voice is important to come into the conversation. And together we find a solution. I really, you know, students ask me, I was Skyping with kids in Poland at 4.30 this morning, and, and they're always asking, you know, how, how can you still believe in people? Why are you optimistic? They seem to pick that up after spending some time together. And, and, I, and I'm like, I've chosen to believe that people care. It's easy if you believe people don't care to have enough evidence to see. Selfish, they're only in it for themselves. But I believe people care. We just often don't know how to care. So that's why I'm excited about all kinds of little tools and graphics that we might talk about a little more this evening about how and why people do go from violent, I mean, neighbors to violent, and they go back. And, and there are, in Rwanda, I would say we have a lot of people on the end of the spectrum towards Maria, and we still have people on the other end of the spectrum really hurt and really angry. And we have a large mass in the middle. And I am, I am super optimistic about the power of stories to connect us, empathy. And then as we practice inclusion, if we look around during this time, we will see, um, who's the guy from the office who just started the, John, uh, yeah, I just started this, what, what good news network? We, we look around. And we find there's a lot of evidence that people do care. They just need to know how to care. Thanks for that question. I sent that John Krasinski video to my team. That made me happy too. Um, uh, thanks. Next question. Um, so within the actual 100 days of the genocide, was anyone using the term genocide? Um, I feel like it was right around the end of April that I first started hearing it being used. Um, I had communication every day with Teresa. But when we talked, we didn't really talk a lot about the genocide or world events. We talked family talk. My connection to the world was through the BBC. I had a little shortwave radio in my house. And um, I believe it was towards the end of April that I started hearing this word. And, you know, I'm kind of, well, I'm, I'm a bit embarrassed to say that I didn't know much about genocide in 1994. I knew about the Holocaust and I had read stories and studied, but I didn't know much uh, about the Cambodian genocide and the other genocide, the Armenian genocide. I, I didn't know much about it. And so it was the end of April that we started hearing that terminology. And I'll just add on, um, if you watch Ghost of Rwanda, you know, they, they definitely dance around not using the term as if, if they use the term, they would have to do something. Tragically, with the genocide in Darfur that is still like a slow motion lingering genocide, we called it genocide and we still haven't taken definitive action to end it. Thank you for that. Um, I have a, a question from a, a university professor now who actually her students just watched Ghost of Rwanda and uh, read work okay. by S Samantha Power. Um, it said that she's noticed that over the past 20 years she's been teaching her students often know little about the Rwandan genocide um, or other, other things like Myanmar uh, when they come into the class. So do you have any thoughts on when and how genocide should be addressed in the, the K through 12 education system? Oh, um, absolutely. I, I, I love 
getting in with first graders and second graders. And we start talking about respect, empathy, and inclusion. No, we're not using graphic images and we're not even using the word genocide, although we do use the terms us and them. I remember asking some first and second graders, um, do you guys know what empathy means? And this one little guy is like, oh, 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 oh. And so I call on him and he goes, um, um, and about 10 ums later, he says, feeling what other people feel? And I'm like, yeah, way to go. And so definitely we can start age appropriate with these basic ideas of we don't solve problems by getting rid of people. We solve problems by bringing people together, more heads, more wisdom, more experience, more potential for creative solutions. And so I definitely um, believe that we can't, we can't start too, too young. I think, I think the problem is sometimes we have, we have kind of locked genocide or Holocaust in its own little box. And, and it is a very unique, specific event that happens with very defined, you know, um, parameters and causes and stages in there. But when we look deep at it, I believe we come with that basic definition I had earlier. It stems from thinking that says my world would be better without you in it. And then, and then we have conversations about the power of words and, and how words are um, forming pathways in our brain and even though i say oh i was just joking it's making pathways and those pathways are unconsciously affecting other pathways so i think we can start right right as soon as we're interested in stories and there are wonderful storybooks out there too for the little ones about why why does somebody care about how dark my skin is we have all of those different stories and resources thanks for bringing that question Great. And I'll give a, a little plug for the museum here. We're actually doing one of our virtual series that we just started as a, a story time for little ones teaching uh, inclusion and tolerance and empowerment through through nice. those kinds of books you're talking about. So that's Friday mornings at 930 if anyone's interested in joining us. Um, this next one's sort of a two part. Um, I'm going to combine two, two different questions we got. Um, so what, you know, in this re-entry process that, that you were describing uh, in Rwanda, what does that recidivism rate look like? And do you see any examples of similar kind of restorative justice here in the U.S.? Mm, nice, nice. Thank you. Um, really like that. Uh, I'm, it was interesting. I've probably visited about seven uh, or eight prisons in Rwanda. I've had a lot of conversations with prison personnel and some limited conversations with prisoners. I remember asking one assistant warden, I hope this isn't an, a, a, a bad question I said or an or a inappropriate question, but can you tell the difference between prisoners who are here for genocide and prisoners who are here for other crimes? Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely, he said. Um, actually, the ones who are here for genocide help us in re-socializing the other prisoners. You see, the ones who are here for genocide, they were school teachers, they were lawyers, they were, you know, um, nurses, they were all kinds of the whole farmers and carpenters and everyone else. And um, it, it is really an interesting subject. So the recidivism among the people who committed genocide Way, 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 way low. I, I'm sorry I don't have the exact figures, but really, really low. And this idea that they had of if you'll confess, you can come to this tige camp, this reinvent yourself camp. Um, I will just leave that, that uh, slide on the screen here for just a little bit longer as we talk about some of this. Um, they, they started to use the tige camp for people other than those who committed genocide and they started running into some problems and they said, okay, whoa, 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 because the people who committed genocide as horrific and heinous as it is, um, they did not have years, at least many of them, didn't have years of violence to their credit. They might have had years of us and them thinking for some of them, but the solution being violence wasn't, wasn't it. And many of them didn't even have so much of that us and them thinking. Um, the other part in terms of uh, today here in America, um, they're pretty small. They're pretty small. 
I would, I would say that, and I look for them, newspaper articles and things like this. If I can just take a moment to say, restorative justice as I understand it, and again, I'm just a learner in this area too, but it's about bringing all the voices together and understanding the harm. Not blaming, understanding the harm, and then looking for solutions to restore, repair that harm. And, and, it, and it needs all the voices here in the conversation. Whereas punitive justice often drives the actual voices of the, those who, who did the harm and those who were harmed to the periphery, and it becomes an argument or, or whatever, a debate between attorneys and the judge. And, and, it, and, the, and the idea of punishing somebody, I just don't think you can ever punish anybody enough um, for some of the crimes that have been done that would satisfy I'm not saying they can't be punished enough, but that would, people would say, okay, that, that, that satisfies it. There seems to be an insatiable appetite for, for, um, for a price when you're looking at this exacting a price from somebody. And in Rwanda, the ultimate price of the death penalty, they said, we can't keep doing that. They started it and they stopped quite very quickly. The president traveled around the country, town hall meetings explaining, we can't use the death penalty. This is not gonna break the cycle of violence like we need that cycle to be broken. This is not gonna build a, a, a sense of unity and reconciliation. And some people were really upset, as you might imagine. My family was all killed. Now is the time we need a death penalty and you're doing away with it after the genocide. So. So restorative justice is often very hard to, to define and implement and satisfy all the different people. If it was easy, it would be happening all the time. But when we see it happen, we see it work, I think we become, I know I have and so many others become believers. And it doesn't have to be just crime, restorative practices in schools. Not, not suspending and expelling students, but finding solutions within, building circles of community and giving vocabulary before the problem comes. And when the problem comes, we already have a community, we have a vocabulary, we have tools in place to use it. So I would, I would say maybe schools would be some of our best places to see some examples of restorative practices um, today in America. Thank you for that. Um, switching gears a little bit, we have a, a question from somebody who wants to know if your parents are still with us and how they've processed all this. She says it must have been so, so difficult to leave their son behind. Um, what would they say to us now about that experience? Yeah, yeah. Thank you for asking about my folks. I'll bring back this picture here. What's kind of interesting is um, this picture in 1994 of my mom and dad. Um, I'm, I'm the same age dad was in 1994. Today, I'm, I'm his age. And um, dad is still doing well. Um, mom passed away a couple of years ago, cancer. And, um, you know, th this is a really good question that we could spend a lot of time on this. And I, and I talked with both of them quite a bit. Um, like any other tragedy um, or trauma, we all process differently. You know, and, and um, I was just listening to this guy. Oh, boy, what's his name? Some of you will know it. He worked with Kubla-Ra, the, the seven, uh, the six stages of grief or death, um, uh, grief anyway. And John, oh, his name's right on the tip of my tongue. And he was talking about how, how losing a child doesn't break up a marriage. It's the judging of the way we grieve, according to him. That, that breaks relationships apart. Mom and dad were able to navigate the different ways that they processed this in a way that didn't drive them apart. And, and I can say the same for Teresa and I. You know, we both have processed about the genocide in different ways, and we learned to allow each other to process in our own way and not judge, oh, don't you care, or doesn't this matter, or make those judgmental statements. So allowing the space for people to process. Um, this guy, boy, if his name's John, some of you can probably text in his name to me, but um, he also talked about separate support systems for couples who are going through trauma that if you try to have the same support system, um, it, it was a really interesting podcast. Okay, a little, uh, boy, we're in Texas, right? Huh? Some of you know Brené Brown. She's got a podcast called Unlocked. So you can find that, uh, that interview 
on uh, her podcast, um, Unlocked, Brené Brown. I, yeah, don't get me started. I'm, I'm, I really appreciate her work. Okay, great. Um, someone has a question. Did other countries besides the U.S. try to get involved in helping during the, the genocide? Okay. Um, I'm going I'm to take this chance to uh, pop a picture up here for you of the UN Security Council. Um, I, as, I, as I alluded to in the story, I think the United Nations made a great decision to send soldiers to Rwanda at the end of the war, stand together with this country. The problem was they only seemed to have a plan A, excuse me, didn't have a plan B if things go, go bad. And, and so they're here debating when the genocide starts what to do. And the ambassador, I believe, of Nigeria, he said, don't withdraw the soldiers. He knew that, that wherever there were UN soldiers, there would be thousands of people that would be there for protection. And that's what happened. And when the soldiers were withdrawn, those people, the vast majority of those people were killed. It's like the, 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 the genocidaires, the people who are perpetrating genocide could say, thank you, UN, you drew people together for us. We didn't have to go hunting in the, in the banana plantations or in the ceilings. So this story of betrayal comes when the Belgian UN soldiers who were there were strategically, the planners of the genocide strategically killed them. And then Belgian took the motion to the U.S., and this is how the story is told in Ghost of Rwanda. And, and the U.S. used its influence at the Security Council to withdraw the soldiers from Rwanda. So when people say, did anybody else get involved or besides America? America got involved in a good way at the beginning, as did the U.N. in sending soldiers there, which I think was the right decision. But then we really, really, really made it unbelievably worse when we voted to take the soldiers away from there. And any other country who did uh, something, I'm hard put to think of any country, I'm, I'm sure there must be something out there, but from somebody, from my vantage point in Kigali throughout the genocide, um, I saw one diplomat from France during that time. And of course the French government, there's a, there's a ton of evidence that has stacked up of the French government's involvement in the genocide, not stopping. But within that French government, there were some, I think in every area there were, in every government there were voices, but those voices just, didn't, they were few and far between. And I don't know of any, of, the genocide was started by the extremist, and the genocide was ended by the Rwandan Patriotic Front. And uh, there was a little bit of aid that would come in. A, a few UN soldiers did stay, like maybe 270, and they saved the lives of thousands, which makes, and I'm not exaggerating that word thousands, which makes a very powerful argument for if all 2,500 would have stayed, they could have stopped it. So I, I wish I had another country. Neighboring countries opened their borders. I mean, they didn't stop people from fleeing into their country. I suppose that's one level of help, but there wasn't that I know of. Yeah, thank you. Um, also, someone chimed in and said, are you thinking of John Bowlby? Bowlby? Is that the name that you're I, thinking of, the Greek? No, I also I, I also saw John Kessler right. was another name I saw. Kessler, that's it. Kessler, Kessler. that's the one? Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I, we think we have time for a couple more questions. I actually wanted to start with a, a comment from one of our staff members who wanted to make sure you knew that um, Lydia, who was in one of the orphanages um, that you helped protect, spoke at our opening last September and said that you were her personal hero. So we wanted to make sure that you knew she was with us for that I, event. I, I, I watched Lydia, uh, Lydia's speech online. She did an excellent job. And it is super rewarding to go back to Rwanda and um, to meet up. Uh, this gentleman was just a little kid in the orphanage at the time. And now the orphanage has been turned into a school. And, 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 uh, and he teaches music in an after-school program. It's, it's really exciting to meet the different people and see what they're doing with their lives. They, so many of the people who survived the genocide have decided not to be defined by what they lost, 
but be defined by what they do with what they still have. And there's a lot of inspiring stories. So thanks, thanks, Lydia. <laughs> Um, I, we have a lot of questions, but I think we only have time for a couple more. So I'll do, uh, I'll do this one. Someone would like to know if, if you have any book recommendations. I know you have one that, uh, yeah. that you wrote, if you want to plug that one one more time, but do you have any others that you'd recommend about this, this time? Oh, well, um, we, um, the top of my list right now for book recommendations for Rwanda is a book called Untamed. Uh, by Celine Uineza, and you can probably send that out or somebody may, might be able to put that on the screen or, or circulate it. Um, the reason I really appreciate that book, the first half of it talks about um, her experience as a child during the genocide, and then the second half is about healing. And, and she is so vulnerable, she is so articulate, she is so passionate in, 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 in sharing her journey of healing. Um, vulnerability we we are we some at least are beginning to realize the power in vulnerability and how we realize that hiding these things and and this you know pressing it down and saying just move on and stuff it it it, it doesn't work that way for at least most of us and so i really appreciate her book untamed um, I think that if somebody wanted to, well, you mentioned our book, I'm Not Leaving. I, I did make tapes to my wife during the genocide. So we have a little book that, uh, that's based on those tapes to my wife and, and children. Um, but another recommendation from that time uh, I would, uh, that comes to my mind is um, um, Stephen Kinzer. Uh, boy, the name, some of these books have long titles, The Rebuilding of a Nation and the Man. Land of a Thousand Hills, Land of a Thousand Hills, The Rebuilding of a Nation and the Man Who Dreamed It. Look up Stephen Kinzer. Um, a, a, that book also has a good chunk of it about the recovery story there. Even though it's several years old, it's got a, it's got a good, yeah, please, I, I, I'd be happy to share. Um, Celine's book, uh, Untamed, is just a great, it's a short read, and it's, like I said, it's very, um, it's 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 one of the one of the best ones it's on the top um of my list in terms of understanding some of 94 i mean it's hard to tell the whole story but then that journey and afterwards and how do we deal with trauma one of the biggest things that um that is obviously important in my life but i think we learn from there um some of the other books some of the you know the the good standby ones philip gorovich's book um this is another long title name we regret to inform you that tomorrow we will be killed along with our family um would be a, would be another one a um a really interesting piece is on netflix um right now morgan freeman and it's it's the series is called the story of us and it's the second episode about 30 minutes in. And you'll actually meet, uh, Morgan Freeman will meet Maria and Filbert, who I mentioned earlier here. Um, and, uh, uh, and, and they get to meet Morgan Freeman. Um, but uh, that's, a, that's a really interesting piece too. Um, boy, in terms of other books right now. I think you've given um, us a good list to start with okay. for sure. <laughs> okay, thanks. Um, all right, we'll, we'll end on this question. I think this is a nice one. I don't think she'll mind me uh, calling her out by name. It's from Kathleen Cadigan, who's a, an educator at Thomas Jefferson High School here in Dallas. You have visited with her class before, and she yeah, says they're, I remember. they're sorry to miss you this spring. Um, but she asks, what message do you have for young people who study the beauty and terror of Rwanda and are looking at the challenges of the world today? Mm, mm, good, good, good. Um, well... The story of Rwanda has really motivated many people to, to get involved in building a more peaceful um, world. It, it has really motivated many people into activism. And I think the first thing that kind of comes to my mind with activism, as I've been involved for quite a few years, is how easy it is to burn out. And so I think probably one of the first things I would say I don't know where I learned this. I've looked all over the internet, so I don't take credit for it. But the idea is that if we hate evil more than we love beauty, we're like on a, on a, on a track for a train wreck, for burnout. 
We've got to, in fact, the brain people tell us negative stuff sticks like Velcro, positive stuff slides off like Teflon. We've got to look for the good, finding the good. When I go to Rwanda with teachers, the first day I say, look guys, we're gonna see stuff that could destroy a person's soul, their belief in humanity or life or anything. It's horrible. And, and this evening, I didn't go there. I, I definitely gave a light version of, of Rwanda's story. But it can, be, it can just destroy as you listen to the testimony of survivors and things. And so every morning and every evening, we have a Finding the Good session where each teacher, a different teacher, every morning and every evening, leads a conversation. What did we see good today? What did we see beautiful today? And if we have trouble finding the good in situations, my little formula is be quiet, be present, and memorial site, a really tough one in Rwanda called Morambi with some students. It's a very difficult memorial to site, site to visit, very graphic. And a kid was just feeling, he told me later, like just crushed underneath it. But he said, I remembered to be quiet, be present, be patient. And in the quietness, I heard a cow. And then I heard some kids laughing. And then I heard some music on a hill over there. Um, to have centering techniques is so important in, in um, dealing with this trauma. And, and I think we need to understand that the, the horrors, the graphic nature of the horrors often is what people think we need to bring about sustainable change. If we can just shock or, or you know, show them, we'll, we'll wake them up and they'll change. Well, it can shock and it can wake people up, but I don't believe that those prolonged engagement in the horrors is, is effective in building sustainable peace. We have to know those stories absolutely, and, and we don't cover them, no, or bury them. But what really, and, and that can get our attention at times, but what I believe really brings sustainable change is acts of humanity. Acts of inhumanity in, in bulk. I, I've talked to teachers and like the students are like, please, no more. This is so, this is, this is crushing me. And, 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 I, and I think we've got to, we've got to include the stories of humanity. In humanity, we draw back. Humanity we draw in. And that's why I talk about people like my friend Gasiqua bringing chickens to killers and stories of Maria, stories of people who demonstrate respect, empathy, and inclusion. So thanks for asking that. I'm a big believer in finding the good. And you know, one of, my, one of the students that, um, a school that I visited, she wrote me a letter. And from her letter, I did this little this little drawing. And I would say that this would be something too, not just for high school students, but for all of us. If you can figure out my code here, this is supposed to be a stop sign, you know, with a line drawn through it. And, and, it, and it represents stop thinking one thing, or stop one thing thinking. You know, when I saw Filbert this last summer and I simply got stuck in 1994, I was only thinking about 1994. When Maria looked at Filbert, she saw a totally different person than the person I saw because she had been through shared experiences with him and she had courageously made the decision to not only accept his apology, but also accept his, his offers of kindness. And, and as I said, even to the level, and I don't, I'm not saying everybody should do this by any stretch of the imagination, but when her daughter got married, they didn't just invite Filbert to the wedding, but they also asked him to be the MC. And I was just like, whoa, 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 wait a minute, Maria. And when I got a chance to ask her a question, I said, Maria, didn't that make your family upset when you invited him? Any other family who had survived? And she says, yeah, but his family was upset when he asked my daughter to be the godmother of his children. And, and Maria demonstrated the last thing, you guys are really humoring me here, the last little tool that I'd like to put forth here is, is this one of asking myself, who's in the center of the universe? I said, Maria, 
wasn't your family angry? And I had Maria right in the center and she said, yeah, they were. But then Maria very deftly stepped out of the center and put Philbert in the center and said, but his family was also upset with him when he asked my daughter to be the godmother. I think our ability during this time of the coronavirus and stuff to step out of the center, to, to step away, I should go through this whole thing without mentioning it, but to step away from hoarding toilet paper, to, to actually putting somebody else in the center. And you did that at the beginning of this program, or, or Mary Pat mentioned the healthcare workers right now and what they're doing at this time. I think our ability to develop sustainable peace is directly linked to our ability at times. There are times we need to be in the center of the circle and, and you could explore um, self compassion. Check out some of Kristen Neff's work about self-compassion. But, but if we spend the majority of our time in the center, we're, we're not going to, the empathy will not begin to grow. We will not be able to build. Um, we won't get through this virus thing in a positive way. My hope is we come through this virus thing. And these are actually the words of my friend Keel that we won't come out the other side still thinking the same way and behaving the same way that we went into the virus and uh, to this virus right now. And I, and I believe that this is, for me personally, a really effective tool asking myself, you know, when the guy cuts in front of me on the freeway and I feel my blood pressure raise a little bit, okay, who's in the center? Maybe he just got a call and his daughter's, you know, in the hospital. So thank you guys so much for your question. Those who still have questions, um, I'm, uh, I'm more than happy to respond even if you send an email. Is, is it all right if I share my email? I mean, it's all right with me, uh, Anna. You just- Yeah, we can, if you wanna share it here or if, you, if you'd like, I can send it, send it an email to everyone who attended. Is that all right with you? Okay, yeah, perfect. that's fine. And I'm happy to put it on the screen here too. Oh, there it is. Wilkins at yahoo.com and we can continue the conversation. We're looking for ways to continue these conversations. We're meeting with students on, on Zoom and uh, adult groups on Zoom and we want to continue these conversations because we really do believe. And this is why an organization like the um, Dallas Holocaust and Human Rights um, Museum is here. We learn from the experiences of the past. And, we, and, and in Rwanda's case, we have so many of the people still with us that we can learn from. And so what are these stories from the past? How do they inform our thinking and our feelings and our choices today? And we wanna continue those conversations. So I'm looking forward to checking out too, more of the uh, resources you guys have on your website there at the museum. Yes. and uh, when we can come together. Thanks so much for hosting this. Thank you so much, Carl, and thank you everyone for being here. Um, I'm, thank you for putting your email up. We had a lot of questions we couldn't get to, um, and I'm gonna steal that finding the good moment twice a day. That sounds like a good thing to do right now. So uh, thank you again, and thank you to everyone for your patience as we experiment with this new platform. We hope you'll join us for some of our other virtual programs coming up, and stay in touch, and, and thank you again, Carl. Everyone have a good evening. Thank you. Take care. Stay healthy.